up, everyone? Welcome to Political Insider. I'm Brett Smith, your humble host. Joining me today is a very special guest. She's a recovering investment banker, a New York Times bestselling author, an entrepreneur, TV pundit, a strong advocate for small business, and more importantly, big hair. And she has a brand new book out, The War on Small Business. Carol Roth, it's so great to have you here. Yeah, Brett, really thanks for having it. me. I'm excited to be here with you. Well, you know, I, I want to commend you on your big hair because as a fellow Gen Xer, I want to make America 80s again. Anyone who follows me knows that. And you're helping bring that dream to fruition. And I really appreciate it. Well, that's fine. I'm actually the self-appointed unofficial spokesperson for Gen X. So this should be a fabulous discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so congratulations on the new book and its success. Give our viewers your elevator speech on the war on small business, uh, what it's about and why you decided to write it. So this is the most underreported, um, probably important story to come out of the last 12 to 15 months. And it is about the government picking winners and losers, deciding who was quote unquote essential and who was quote unquote non-essential, not based on data or science, but based on political clout and connections and how that enabled the most historic wealth transfer that we have ever seen from Main Street to Wall Street. So that's that's the elevator pitch on it. Um, you know, I wrote it, I was actually approached to write a book about the economic implications of what was cleared to be a historic economic event in terms of the what I call government reaction to the pandemic. It's not the pandemic itself, it's the government reaction to the pandemic. And so uh, I spent a year just digging in. And as I went along, I sort of wrote like three and a half different books. Uh, but this is the one that, you know, when we kind of chipped away at all the ice and said, you know, what is that important story? Um, that was the one that really stood out. And then putting that in a historical perspective of this big battle that we have going on between decentralization and central power. So that's kind of the macro theme that sits on top of the book using this historical point in time as sort of the entry point for the discussion. Interesting. Interesting. Um, you, you know, like you and a lot of our viewers, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been a small business owner, sub S for 26 years, and I've navigated the ups and downs in the markets over the years. I've seen small business thrive and suffer. I've never seen small business suffer like it did over the last year. Um, the lockdowns were just brutal. They were cruel. It was an outright assault on small business um, like I've never seen. And to make things worse, large corporations were treated differently. Like you said, you talk about this in your book, how the government chose winners and losers during the crisis and how small business essentially became eminent domain. Uh, explain what you mean by that. Yeah. So, you know, when people say, well, we had these lockdowns, we actually didn't have lockdowns. And that's the, the first point I always like to push back on is we had partial targeted lockdowns, again, not based on science, but based on who was connected. So Amazon's warehouse never shut down. Your grocery store didn't shut down. Your liquor store definitely didn't show, shut down. In fact, weed dispensaries, which had been illegal in many jurisdictions just a few years prior, were now all of a sudden deemed essential. But your dry cleaner, your gym, your pizza place, hair salon, you know, going down the list were all the ones that were targeted. Um, so, you know, that really was sort of the, the crux of the picking of winners and losers. And again, if you were going to do that, there is a concept, as you alluded to, called eminent domain um, in the Constitution. If the government mm -hmm. is going to take your property for the quote unquote public good, which is what they did here. They said, you, you can't use your property for the public good, then they owe you due compensation. And the small businesses were not given due compensation. And I walk through PPP and some of the relief, um, and we're still seeing the issues ongoing, but it was a fraction of the overall dollars that were spent. It wasn't even a trillion dollars that was given out versus the six you know, plus trillion dollars that was spent on COVID relief. Um, and certainly for the duration of time that these small businesses were asked to give up their business, did not compensate them for taking you know, taking over their property under eminent domain. And so that becomes the issue for the people who, you know, many of us feel like full liberties, let people understand the risk. 
-hmm. the elderly, we're vulnerable, you know, let's do something to take care of them, let everybody else mitigate the risk themselves. But if you're going to say lockdowns, then you have two choices. Then everyone gets locked down. There's no Federal Reserve pumping up the stock market. There's no, you know, Amazon warehouse gets to be open, those kinds of things, which by the way, if that would have happened, this wouldn't have lasted like two to three weeks. Or you say, okay, well, we're going to somehow pick this random set, but we're going to compensate them for it. And you can make an argument, you know, even though if you don't agree with it, at least that that's, that's fair and just based on the concept of individual rights and property rights uh, and the constitution. But what was done was none of that. We didn't have full lockdowns. We didn't have full liberty and we didn't have appropriate compensation. And that's where you see really the targeting of small business and of sort of the the average American and part of what helped to enable this historic wealth transfer. It seemed like nobody, like everybody stopped believing in private property. That, that was kind of the first thing that I saw. I, and, and I could not believe that people were willfully giving up their private property. Even conservatives yeah. were just kind of like, well, it's just, you know, it's instead of opening my business and making money that I've, that, you know, that I've, that I've, you know, that I started 40 years ago or 30 years ago, I'll just stay shut down and look for my government check. Uh, I've just never seen culturally, I've never seen anything like this before as far as the reaction and just how people sort of willfully gave into all this stuff. It was really disturbing. And I, and I think it's something that um, is a precedent that's been set in America, which is really dangerous. I, I could not agree more. I remember having a conversation with my husband uh, in February when this was obviously percolating in other places, and it was pretty clear that the U.S. was going to be the next stop. And we said, well, like, you know, what would you do? Like, could you lock everyone down? And we both like laughed and we're like, well, no, obviously that's not an option. And so the fact that people were willing to go along with this, um, with the exception of some heroes, a few of whom I, I've highlighted in the book, uh, it's staggering and it's frightening both internally and externally, you know, from a, a government tyranny perspective to say that, that the citizens of the United States of America would so quickly acquiesce and go along with this uh, is just mind blowing. And then externally too, like what does it say to, you know, these other um, countries who may have nefarious intentions in terms of the big bad people in the United States who are, you know, standing up for freedom, just how quickly so many people rolled over. So that's really, um, I think, probably the, the biggest surprise that I, I saw last year and, and one that I think, as you mentioned, sets a really bad precedent. There were a few people, you, me, Jesse Kelly, who's our mutual friend, um, that were basically, uh, you know, kind of out there screaming from the rooftops that this is really bad. This is not going to work. And frankly, the idea that you're going to, I mean, just the, it's so absurd. The idea that you're just going to shut down an economy of, uh, 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 what are we, a, a 14 trillion or $20 trillion economy, 22 north trillion. Of north of 21 trillion before COVID. And we're going to just shut all that off as if, as if it's like a faucet that you can just <laughs> crank, you know, and then, and then at your leisure, turn it back on. You know, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm pretty much economically self-taught. I learned nothing in high school from government and econ. <laughs> Rush Limbaugh and other conservative pundits, uh, Milton Friedman, Dr. You know, Dr. Walter Williams, uh, guys like that taught me economics. So I'm not like some expert. I'm not you. But even I could tell that and I could see clearly that this is not going to work. You can't do this. Uh, and yet we did. And now we're seeing, you know, the fallout of it. And and I keep coming back to this, and this is something that you hit on, Jesse Kelly hit on, and others. We're going to turn off a $22 trillion economy over a virus with a 99.9% .9 recovery rate. I mean, this is not smallpox. This is not the Black Death. What, what are we thinking? Well, again, to be fair, they turned off 
a portion of it. <laughs> so it was, I would say, I would approximate it was about a third of a half of the economy right. that got turned off, uh, which is still like staggering. If you look at the GDP drop um, on an annualized basis, it was almost 33%, which you know nothing like that in history. I think it was 8.4% during the Great Recession, which was an actual systemic you know, crisis um, and a global crisis. And it's funny that you use the faucet analogy. I use the power cycling, the modem analogy. So same kind of thing. Yep. And it's staggering, like even today for these people to say, oh, like we didn't see, we didn't expect to see these disruptions, like disruptions in the supply chain or disruptions and people going back to work when we all identified these things uh, going back to you know, early on the, you know, the first and second quarter of 2020. So either they are lying, which I think is probably the case, or they are completely incompetent or some you know, combination of the two. But either way, you know, the, the, it doesn't matter. Like I, I try to keep people from debating about whether it was intentional, whether it was irrational, whether it was yeah, incompetence, because yeah. it doesn't matter. The outcome is still the same and the systemic issues are still the same when you look at this centralization of power that we see happening and we have fewer people making decisions using force coercion and control for large groups of people instead of, instead of letting you know, free market tenants free choice um, and transparency allow to be to be our ruling principles and the outcomes um, and we've seen we have all data throughout all history and all time to see <laughs> that it doesn't work when you have that um, and human nature is human nature. So to like sit and pretend that these people were going to somehow have some genius level outcome um, is silly. But again, we don't need to debate the intentions. It's just mm -hmm. what what do the outcomes look like? And the outcomes are never going to be good, no matter how many times you believe in rainbows and unicorns and think, oh, if I just get my guy in there, it's going to fix everything. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's kind of like I, I agree. I think I think the the argument over whether it was uh, you know intentional or intentional or forced coercion or just stu pure stupidity or some somewhere in between, it doesn't matter. You know, it's like Teddy Roosevelt said: only results count. And I don't understand why we just didn't allow people. You know, quarantine the elderly, quarantine anybody over eighty, because it base COVID basically slaughtered anybody over eighty. Uh, it was more of or, or even better, just suggest to them, hey, this is going to kill you and still let them make that choice because well, there were other people who decided who were elderly to go out and live their lives. And if they're like, you know what, you know, I've got cancer, I've got something else, I'm going to like die in six months anyway. Again, like it's, it's not up to you and me to make that decision for somebody. What happened to personal responsibility? What happened to allowing people to assess risk? Um, I, I know the millennials and the Gen Zers are very risk averse in comparison to Gen Xers. You know, we live our lives by the risky business rule of um, what the F. Sometimes you got to say it, uh, you know, and I just think that, you know, our generation, I think, understands risk more and looked at the numbers and said, you know what? I'm young. I'm healthy. I don't have comorbidities. I'm under 80. I want to live my life. And that's partially why I live in America is because we live in a free society and you get to choose. This is the first time I've seen where the government actually coerced people into basically bending their will, to their will and they capitulated. And, I, and I, it's really sad. But here's the interesting thing. And this is where I feel like the politicization of everything is really to our detriment is that the risks people are willing to accept, the narrative around that was completely different between COVID and the vaccine. So during COVID, you know, it started out with 15 days to slow the spread or flatten the curve or depending on you know, how you adapted that language. But it, the stated goal was never to not make sure, make sure that not one person dies. Like that's just not realistic. So that was the stated goal. But if like one person died, people were like, you're a grandma killer. I can't believe you. This is terrible. We can't accept one death. But on the vaccine side of things, you know, obviously for 99 plus percent of the people, it's completely effective as far as we know so far. Um, but there is some percentage of, of people who have side effects. So if one person is to die on that side, well, it's okay because that's for a, a goal that I'm okay with. And that's where 
you know, you just start to see this hypocrisy in the gaslighting that the part that frustrates me so much. Like if you are somebody who is risk averse and that's just your natural bent, like I understand that. I don't think you should legislate that for everybody else, but like I understand that. But when you're you're putting out that position and jumping up and down and screaming about it and then completely changing your position because you want this other outcome. I mean, that's the part that I think is you know, too pervasive and where everything gets so politicized and just there's no level of consistency by which to even make these decisions. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. agree. Um, okay, so like I said, you and I are Gen Xers and since we were born and uh, since we were born, there seems to be these huge economic wipeouts every 10 years or so. Um, just as the middle class starts to gain some traction and economic mobility, we get wiped out by some gigantic economic calamity. Uh, in the 80s, it was the 87 crash. Uh, I think that was Black Friday. In the 90s, it was the savings and loan crisis. Then we had in the late 90s, the tech bubble bursting. Uh, you know, you, you round the corner to 2001, we have 9-11. Then we have the 08 housing crisis predicted by the great Dr. Michael J. Burry. Then we have COVID the mother of all crises and economic wipeouts. Uh, you describe this in your book as the government black swan, government black swan event. Why does this continue to happen from the standpoint of these, these wipeouts come like almost every eight to 10 years and destroy people's capital and kind of knock them down, uh, you know, a bunch of pegs. Um, like I said, why does this continue to happen? And also, What's the difference between these past economic wipeouts and what we just lived through with COVID? Sure. So I think that there is a difference between business cycle shifts and you know other sort of economic calamities. And the, the last one and this one are completely different, um, right. as was sort of the first one. A lot of this has to do um, with federal government or the federal reserve intervention in the market so that's one thing that we need to take a look at um but you know this one wasn't a systemic issue this was government interference into the economy which didn't have to happen at these levels very different than the great recession which was you know different banks and different institutions taking on far too much risk on top of you know, a, an overall sort of risky environment. But again, that was part of an, an easy money scenario. People had, there was too much money letting people go in and make these bets and buying houses that they couldn't afford, um, which again, that would have created a crisis in and of itself. Then you had the banks betting on it, which would have made it slightly worse. The reason it was so bad and so long was because you had, um, an insurance company basically selling a derivative product that was exponentially larger than the underlying market. So uh, the best way to explain that is if there were a hundred mortgages, they had sold insurance as if there were like a million mortgages. And so there was nothing backing that up. There was no balance to that trade. And that's why it ended up being worse, but that w it wasn't the cause of the recession, but that would have been a very small recession. So that was part of the issue. And then the level that the Federal Reserve intervened and the length that it intervened just extended it. I mean, we had seven years of zero interest rate policy, which again, if you want to say, okay, well, we needed something and whatever, we had to save the market and liquidity, whatever, you know, maybe that takes a year or a year and a half and then you start, you know, normalizing and we didn't. And so basically that set us up um, for an already difficult situation, which made it harder for people to uh, attain wealth. And then this crisis, again, you know, completely a manufactured situation by the government intervention. And this wealth transfer was on two levels. It was the government saying, small business, you're going to be shut down. So if somebody wants to spend, they have to spend their dollars at Amazon or Walmart. So their revenues increased. So that's a fiscal issue. But then it was the Federal Reserve coming in, zero interest rate policy. Um, at this point, they added like another almost $4 trillion to their balance sheet. So their balance sheet at this point is up to um, just a hair shy of $8 trillion that, by the way, they've created from nowhere. This is all like a digital entry 
that if like you went into your bank account and just made up money, you'd be put in jail. But for some reason, they feel like they can just go in and, and make up this money from nowhere. And that enabled seven technology companies to gain $3.4 trillion in value last year. Oh, by the way, almost the same amount <laughs> the Federal Reserve printed, not a coincidence there, um, a record year for initial public offerings, a record year for SPACs. So if you were in, you know, that part of the this, you know, kind of consolidated economy and you were already well off, you were doing great. But if you're a, son, a, a saver or a retiree, you, you're going to earn no interest and you're going to have to go take risk in order to get any sort of return on your investment. If you're a small business owner, you're not going to be able to compete because you can't take on debt, but everybody else can. And by the way, they've shut you down. So it's just just on multiple levels. Um, moving wealth and value from Main Street to Wall Street, as well as tamping down on the wealth creation opportunities of this country, which is ownership, it's equity. So it is ownership of stocks, it's ownership of homes, it's ownership of businesses. And they are, in my opinion, intentionally making it more difficult so that you know you become more dependent on the government and have less opportunities um, to be independent and be decentralized. And that should scare everyone. That's moving us towards central planning, socialism, whatever you want to call it, which is not a good outcome for economic freedom, for wealth creation, and you know, for the future of the nation. It's not only a war on small business, um, it's a war on the middle class, essentially. Um, you know, one of the things that differenti differentiates us from socialist countries, especially communist countries, is the existence of a middle class. In these other countries, you have very poor, very rich. Um, wh why is it important for America to have a robust, small, uh, robust middle class uh, where you know, a plurality of the small businesses come from? Um, and yet it just seems like the middle class and small business are just getting crushed all the time, yet at the same time, they're the piggy bank that the government goes to all the time to bail out the rich or these large corporations. Um, you know, everybody always talks about, you know, saving, saving the poor and, and eating the rich. But, you know, we never talk about what's best for the middle class and how do we help the middle class achieve economic mobility and become rich, um, you know, not just stay in the middle class, but continue to move up. Yeah, I mean, you, you unintentionally answer that question by saying in socialism and con communism, you're either rich or you're poor. There, there is no sort of middle of the road wealth creation, free choice opportunity. And that's what we're trying to preserve. We're trying to preserve freedom. We're trying to preserve choice. And it doesn't matter if it's that you're trying to you know, attain dollar wealth, uh, flexibility, pursuing a passion, you know, all of these things are free choice under capitalism. Um, but that doesn't serve those in the, the sort of ruling class, if you will, uh, political expediency, much easier, much more easily achieved with a handful of these big companies that are you know, easy to control and have the dollars to be able to lobby and to fund political campaigns than it is with a bunch of decentralized average Americans, um, which is why a lot of times they have these intermediaries like um, public unions and whatnot to try to, you know, say we're going to take a chunk of those and, and find that, that, you know, centralized power entry point. But, you know, if you want to have economic freedom, if you want to have the next big business, like every big business with the exception of some spinoffs came from a small business. If you want to have and preserve that opportunity, as well as the concept of your individual rights to, to own things, um, then that's why it's important. You know, I am not, you know, I, I'm, I'm fairly common sense, straightforward, not a big conspiracy theorist, but you do look at that uh, World Economic Forum, you know, where people are talking about the Great Reset and saying like, you know, their prediction for 2030 is that you're going to own nothing and be happy and you're going to rent everything. And it's a little too on the nose. Like it's a little, little scary in terms of the normalization of that. And then you're seeing the media run cover 
for things like, well, maybe you shouldn't buy a house. Maybe it's better to rent, you know, like these kinds of language, like language things where it really does seem like there's a concerted effort to talk people out of wealth and ownership. And it's much more difficult to be bought off by the government when you have that ownership of property that you're incentivized to defend. Yeah, this this great reset just um, terrifies me because I see the great reset. I see this introduction to universal basic income, which is what all this these 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 checks that are going out to people. Biden says he wants to extend that until I don't know, like September or something. And I'm uh, my, my buddy Wayne Dupree tweeted that the the other day, and I retweeted it and said, "Hey, welcome to universal basic income." I've been um, saying I've been saying this for a year and a half. This is the test run for it. It's it's whether it's Donnie dollars or Biden bucks, whether it's extended unemployment benefits, you getting money from the government and them saying the government's going to take care of you or let's devalue the dignity of work. You don't have to work. You know, it's not it's not worth your time. It doesn't do anything for you. You're exactly right. This is a test run. You're going to hear universal basic income next. And we know like you don't get rich being on the government dole you get rich you accumulate wealth through ownership and going out and doing that so it's um it's very nefarious it's it's wrapped up in a oh we're trying to help people but the statistics show like they never help anybody there, there's no like little guy long-term benefits that oh i've really done well because the government has been there for me it's the ruse they use to consolidate power and you know whether it's universal basic income or some of these other anti-competitive um things that they're pushing from a regulatory standpoint again this is all impeding wealth creation and economic freedom yeah um it, it's it's really sad to me because i i, I see this universal basic income is basically robbing people of uh, a potential livelihood, a small business, pursuing a dream, their passions, uh, their purpose in life. I mean, we're all just supposed to sit around and collect a check and watch Netflix and do nothing all day. I mean, Wait a minute, but I was told I was told everybody creates wonderful art. <laughs> when that happens and then i mean you would think that this whole test run just proved that but they're going to turn it on its head for sure you remember back in 08 when nancy pelosi was talking about fun employment no i don't thank goodness <laughs> well that was talked about during the obama years when unemployment was high and people were getting checks and it was kind of like hey this is fun employment you know you can stay home and pursue your dreams and do all those things that you never wanted to do you know, which is just a, a, a rash of crap. So I've, I've got to, I've got to bleep myself there. Yeah, um, um, and I will, and I was gonna say going back to UBI. I mean, just like the fact that any, like anyone's even selling this as a good proposal. Like, if you're somebody, because remember, the government doesn't have any money; it doesn't create anything of value. It's either your dollars that they have taken or they have made it up out of nowhere, which devalues your dollar. So like there, there is no like actual money. So they're gonna take your dollar, they're gonna like collect their toll and give you back 75 cents guaranteed. Like who would do that? Like if you wanna, like I'll give you universal basic income if you wanna do that. Send me your dollar, I'll take 25 cents and I will guarantee sending you back 75 cents. Does that sound like a good deal? I'll sign up for that all day long. <laughs> I think that's. I think that's going to be, you know, our our new business venture going forward. Right. Uh, yeah. I, mean, know, I think I'm going to put put it out right after this stream. I'm going into the universal basic income business. Please pay me this much a year, and I will guarantee you, you get this much back a year. It, it'll be called Roth and Smith Investments, and everyone love can it. send 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 uh, payments via PayPal. It's not a problem. I love so it. I'll, yeah. I'll have that set up in uh, 15 minutes after this interview is done. Uh, <laughs> It's just, it's just pathetic. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's crazy. I mean, it's like literally crazy talk. Like, oh, but they'll get, no, they can't guarantee you anything. They have nothing. Why it's is it that? It's like, well, the, yeah. the other, the other thing I met that I noticed is that, you know, a lot of wealthy people, a lot of hedge fund guys and bankers, they all love the idea of universal basic income. And it's more than likely because, you know, where that money's going to come from is not going to be theirs. It's not going to be their wealth. That money's going to be pulled out of the middle class and recycled, or, you know, for a lack of better terms, laundered uh, back to uh, poor people. 
Um, and probably once the middle class is robbed, they'll be in that tax bracket to receive that money back. So the whole thing is robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's no different than Social Security. In fact, that's probably the closest thing to UBI we've had um, is, is Social Security because it's pittance from the standpoint of expecting seniors to live on that. Plus, you know, you, you make it worse by having zero percent interest rates because there's no savings. They can't save anything. So they're they're solely dependent on Social Security and ultimately the government, which is just a recipe for disaster. But what, why do all these rich people, all these one percenters who I don't particularly have an issue with the fact that they have money? What I have an issue with is that they take the attitude that I can't earn my way into their place. You know, it's this idea that America, you know, since 2016, I've been drawing the Caddyshack um, um, analogy, you know, um, and, I, and I drew it to the 2016 election. You have Bushwood Country Club, which is the Republican Party run by Judge Smales. And then you have Al Chervik, Rodney Dangerfield, who comes to Bushwood. He's not a member and he'll never be a member, but he's friends of some friends. So he gets to come and golf. And he likes the place, so maybe he'll buy it. Uh, this was Trump. Trump was Al Chervik coming into the country <laughs> club and just flipping the table over and pissing everybody off. You know, hey, Whitey, where's your hat? You know, that's all of that ribbing, uh, you know, that, that Rodney did to, you know, in, in Caddyshack, it was the, the slobs versus, or it was the slobs versus the snobs. It was the caddies versus the, the, the club members. And I'm seeing a larger analogy now to where you can kind of lump in all of the one percenters as being Judge Smales and the, the, uh, the members at Bushwood Country Club. And it's not just Al Chervik who represented Trump, but it's the middle class. You know, we, we want to be rich too, but it seems like the rich don't particularly like the nouveau riche. And I don't think they ever had or, you know, they ever have, but it seems like it's even more intense now than ever because all these one percenters want us on UBI um, so we can just be indentured servitudes for, you know, uh, indentured servitude forever. All right, there's a lot to break down. First of all, I'm gonna tell you, Brett, that is the most brilliant analogy I've ever heard with, with Trump and Al, like that's hilarious. And I just have to say, I think I'm Bill Murray in this entire situation. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because <laughs> Al Chervik and Trump both had FU money. You know, every American dreams of having enough money to just tell everybody that they don't like to F off. Um, I mean, that's that's part of the American dream because there's there is freedom within that ability. Now, everyone has a different definition of what rich is. You know, it's like asking somebody, what's your dream car? Everyone's going to have a different answer. You know, my, mine's, you know, you know, probably 68, 69, uh, you know, boss 429 Mustang. Other people might say a Porsche or a Ferrari, but it's the same with like the definition of rich. But, you know, what what is it about the rich that they just don't want us in their club? All of us middle class people who are going to come in and maybe not dress quite as nice or, you know, we don't play squash. Um, you know, it's like those dorks in trading places who were, you know, swinging, singing in the in the My choir. Favorite, yes. <laughs> oh, Ch Chaz. Right. Anytime you call. Yeah. Anyway. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, all right. So I have a little bit of problem as somebody who probably technically falls into the percentage um, that is, you know, I, I don't think it's like a 1% versus not, there's always going to be somebody like just by definition, some group is going to be 1%. It, it is sort of this elite and people who are in the club and as somebody who's come from blue collar, the first person in my family to go to college and has created like, like not like not even believable success. Like I wish my father were still here today. He would be like, oh, like, oh my God. And like, it's sad, like I, we can't share it, but like, I feel like that is the American dream. And I have a, an abundance mentality and I believe in capitalism and I know that that's available for everybody who wants to do it without taking away from everyone else. And so I have been calling out what I call, you know, bad rhymes with pity, pity capitalists substitute um, that, that are pulling up the ladder behind them. And I think that there's 
like I, and this is just a hypothesis, like one of two reasons. Either it is, you know, kind of a, well, if I act like I care about these people and want more government, whatever, they'll think I'm a good person and then they won't target me. That could be one reason. Mm -hmm. The other reason, and I see this a lot in, in like with the Silicon Valley bros and, and whatnot, is I think that this is a ego insecurity thing. One of the things about the capitalism is that you can get lucky and be really, really wealthy. It's not to say that you're not a hard worker, but there are plenty of people who work the same level of hard, just one's in the right place at the right time, and like one just does exponentially well the other one does well but it's like there's like a couple extra zeros on one and i think it's like the wizard of oz they don't want people to pull back the curtain if they say anyone can do this they lose their power and their clout and their standing that makes them seem like they're fantastic instead of going no we're just like this is just dumb luck you can do it too like just go in start working for companies get equity like one of them may pay off and you too can be like just like me I feel like that's, you know, this this like e ego insecurity. A lot of these people were probably not that popular when they were younger. Now they're like the, the king of the world. And, you know, they want to make it seem like, you know, this is like a, this exclusive thing when really it's not. It's available. And I'm the opposite. I'm like, everyone come in. There's plenty for everybody. Like, Same so we, we should all have our, you know, have whatever you want. It's great. So I um I feel like because of my background, and because fortunately I'm a, a secure person and have that abundance mentality, I want to bring as many people along with me where I feel like there are other people who want to protect this like secret that like, oh, I'm not really that special or that smart. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah I, I love those are my hypotheses. I mean, I don't have any like tangible proof. It's just it's just a human nature type of guess. So, well, well like well, you, I, I I don't I, believe I, that the. the the, the pie is a zero sum game. You can grow it's the not. pie. We've, we've you can seen grow it, it for everybody. We've seen it. We're, I mean, we, we have a $21 trillion GDP. I mean, do we, like Canada's two, tr like we have companies <laughs> whose market caps are as big as the GDP of Canada. I mean, my God, we know this works, right? We've seen it grow. <laughs> yeah. That's why, that's why I believe that I think it really is kind of like Judge Smales and all the guys at Bushwood Country Club where it's kind of like, hey, this is our place. This is our elite institution. We come from family. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of the, the whole blue blood thing. And, and also, I think that a lot of them think that it is a zero-sum game um, to a large degree. I think that they do want to hold on to their piece of the pie. You know, I, I don't want someone else to have that, you know, because I worked hard to get it. Or I was part of the Lucky Sperm Club which is where 99% of everyone's wealth comes from. Uh, it's inherited. Um, it's actually not true. That's actually it, not true. No. What's the, so we, what's the we have, it's actually, it's in the book, um, but like, I think it's like, it's some crazy numbers. 80% of millionaires are first generation. So that is, that is, that is a non-truth. And so, as I said, like, you know, there are definitely people, I mean, the reality is there's a phrase, shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves in three generations. Most of the people, with a couple of exceptions, that inherit the wealth blow it because they don't have that hunger and that work ethic. And so that is, you know, one of the, the myths. And it's why instead of saying like "eat the rich," like my hashtag is "be the rich." Be the rich. That, that's what we want. Like you don't eat the rich. Like that's silly. Like you want to be the. We just want. We want to have that even playing field. So everyone can be the rich. So like, stop with the eat the rich. Be you want to be like be the rich. That's that's what we should be focused on. Be the we, rich. We should all aspire to be Al Shervik and to roll up into Bushwood <laughs> Country Club in an outrageously ugly car with a crazy horn and uh, some you know a Japanese photographer with twenty cameras around his neck. I mean and that's I get, just get no respect, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh. That, but I mean, that's, I want to crash the party too. You know, I mean, I want, you know, I mean, that's part of the fun. Uh, I did. Like, I crashed the party. It's like not that big of a deal. Like, I just feel like, and again, like it, it requires a lot of hard work and it requires some luck and it requires a lot of perseverance. And again, not everybody's focus is, is monetary. Like there are other things, which is also great. I mean, think about like how privileged that is around the world. There are people who are fighting 
to just make a living for themselves, let alone thinking like I want to choose how to do it, let alone thinking in terms of that choice, I actually want to do something I'm passionate about. I mean, like we don't realize because we are in such a great situation in time and history, what a privilege that is. That being said, there is a legitimate concern about the playing field being tilted um, in favor of the people who are connected, and that's the part we need to tear down. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you corrected my percentage on um, the 99% inheriting that stuff. I, I didn't know that, it's really interesting. Yeah. And I have no problem with being corrected, so it actually makes me feel better about the whole game. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's actually, there's, there's a, a whole um, section in the book where we talk about a little bit about economic mobility because that's one of the things that people don't believe in. And it's some crazy number of people and I, the actual numbers in the book that will reach the 1% of income earners at least one year in their life. Mm -hmm. But it's then, okay, once you do that, you know, are you able to buy a house with all without all of this like extra interference and continue to build wealth, you know, are you able to buy into the stock market without it being overinflated and about ready to crash? Are you able to start a business? So it's like there is that inherent opportunity, but it's being squashed in terms of that full wealth creation opportunity. So, yeah, you know, getting back to um, uh, small business, you know, and, and COVID and what we're going through with uh, everything reopening. Um, what can small business do right now to not just survive kind of the aftermath of COVID, but also to thrive in the aftermath of COVID, especially considering now we have an administration that seems to be kind of hostile towards small business and sides with the uh, Chamber of Commerce up there in D.C., which is clearly not on the side of small business or the middle class. I think I think your local uh, chambers, you know, it's it's a case by case basis, but Correct. the National Chamber up in D.C., uh, they want slave labor. They want, you know, they want endless immigration and open borders. Uh, they probably also favor uh, universal basic income. But, um, you know, as a small business person, how do you navigate this stuff? What are some, you know, what are some things that people can do um, yeah. to gain the gain the advantage? So one of the things that small business owners have, it, like an inherent advantage is in the loyalty and relationships they can build with their customer base. You know, that's something that a big company cannot do and certainly not at the level that a small business can. And I think people are hypersensitive to this. So if it, you make it easy for them to help you and you really put it out to them to help, people will step up and whether it's, hey, we've had a really hard year, we need cash flow, would you consider buying some gift certificates for the next year? Or we've started a fund to help our workers, or instead of doing your back to school shopping at Amazon, will you do your back to school shopping here? Like, I feel like if you, as a small business owner, reach out and are transparent with your customers, people will step up to help you, but you just have to do it and you have to make it easy because it's not something that's automatic, unfortunately, in people's brains. So I think that's a, a big thing. I also think that small business owners should be banding together to support um, collaboration, especially with, with small business owners is, you know, the new competition. And so particularly if you have sim similar customer bases, like cross promote, cross sell, do things again to promote other small businesses and give your business to other small businesses so that we can, can build mm -hmm. up um, and fortify this like important half of the economy. And I would also consider taking legal action. There are a couple um, of organizations, Pacific Legal is one of them, that fight infringements of your rights. So if you feel like your rights are being uh, improperly trampled upon by the government, like stand up and we need to sue on these things. We need more legal challenges and pushing back. And some of these organizations, as I said, they, they will represent, if they take on your case, they will re represent you for free. It's at their foundations. Um, so take advantage of that and start putting forth some legal challenges so they know that they can't just keep doing these things over and over and hopefully you can get your appropriate compensation. I mean, if, if my business had been impacted the way some of these others were. I mean, it was, but not to a level where 
um, it, you know, it would make sense to, to pursue anything. Yeah. But if I had like a, a, a unit and you shut me down and like, I would be going after the government on that. Where are the class action lawsuits? They're coming. I mean, They're coming. Okay. Uh, because, you know, because here in Arizona, um, all this was done by executive fiat. There were no legislators didn't right. pass any laws. Right. Um, the and governors. They and they, they just. Can't. I mean, come on. It's again, it's that we have eminent domain for a reason. So um, I've heard that there's some that are percolating in Minneapolis. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard a few other things. And as I said, I've been out sort of spreading the word. So I would imagine we'll see. They're certainly not as widespread or they didn't happen early enough. Um, but hopefully in retrospect. And again, it's a lose-lose situation because the government has no money. So if they lose, it's still our money. Um, but given the amount that we've been wasting on all kinds of other things, you know, in the um, the spirit of constitutionality, I mean, it is due to these individuals. So hopefully uh, they will get their due. And again, it's not it's a fraction of like you look at the SBA, the SBA just pulled from three, almost 3,000 minority and small women owned businesses that they promised relief out of this relief fund, they pulled their promises. They had told them, you're getting X dollars, it'll be in your bank the next three to seven days. Then it was found that they made these decisions based on discriminatory practices. So instead of going back and getting more money so they could you know, take care of all the applicants, they pulled it from the people they said was okay and now gave it to a different set of people. And again, we're talking billions, which not to downplay that, but we've spent six plus trillion dollars on like everyone and their brother. So like, this is not like, you know, stop funding shrimp walking on treadmill underwater and take that money and you give it to these people that you've promised that you're supposed to be supporting. So these are the advocates for a small business in Washington, D.C., and this is their behavior. So, like, what do you expect? Uh, it, it, it's just unreal. I, I don't even, I, I mean, first of all, the EEOC, which is basically worthless, um, from Hollywood saying they're only going to hire certain, you know, uh, people of race for certain uh, for certain parts to uh, By the way, it's now still, it's still illegal to ask anybody these questions. <laughs> I mean, if you if you look at the actual law in the book, like you they want the data, but they also say it's illegal to get the data. So I like I'm so confused by the whole thing. At this point. I don't understand any of this. Um, I mean, the EEOC, like I said, they they're worthless. You know, it, it's another government bureaucracy that exists to do nothing because they sit by and they watch blatant discrimination happen and they never move and the whole thing's a joke. It's, it's actually set up to make us yell at each other so that we're distracted and we don't point the fingers at the government and hold them accountable for the you know looting of America. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of the stuff is just to divide people. It's a, it's a distraction against what they're doing back in D.C. Um, I like to say that... Um, Blazing Saddles did more to heal race relations than all of the great society um, and all the money they spent. You know, when when you can lampoon everybody, nobody's offended. And then on top of that, when you lampoon everybody, everybody's laughing at everybody. And then everybody gets along and sees each other's absurdities. And it's not a big deal anymore. So Richard Pryor and Mel Brooks did more for uh, to, to healing yeah. race relations than than any government program, frankly. And Gen X during that period, you know. Everything was integrated. My best friend growing up was half Indian, half Mexican. My other best friend was black. Um, he was also loaded. He had all the I, I always say that. Like the, my heroes growing up, Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, Janet Jackson. I mean, for yeah. better or for worse at the time, Bill Cosby and his family. You know, like, yeah, like we just didn't think and, of and these things, right? There's nothing wrong with still loving the Cosby show. No, There's nothing absolutely wrong. Nope. nothing it's wrong with it. Wonderful, it, wonderful family show. It was a beautiful show. It was fantastic. They were also loaded. I mean, doctor, lawyer. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, <I> love it. <laughs> you know nu nuclear family. You know, right. I mean, you want you want to talk about being threatening. You know, Roseanne was on the cusp of basically kind of bringing back an element of family ties with that show. Her 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 new show that she relaunched right. and then lasted for a season. You know, record ratings and everything. But this idea that we can disagree and still get along as we all did in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s you know 
it, it's one of those things where we've gotten we've we've actually regressed. You know, we're going in the opposite direction, whereas our generation were really kind of on a path towards. Um, I, I don't think there was really basically any racism going on in the 80s or the 90s. And if it was, it was a very small percentage or discrimination. Um, certainly I mean, didn't I, exist I in my world. There, there is, but it's systemic. It's things like the war on drugs that, you know, destroyed families and, you know, took men out of the homes. And, you know, obviously this isn't my purview, so I don't want to spend a lot of time in there. Yeah. But the, the systemic issues, again, go back to the government trying to keep people on the government dole and keep them um, you know, tied to government and not allow for wealth creation opportunities. I mean, that's what caused this, you know, perceived regression in, in many ways. But anyway, that's it. I'm, I'm not an expert in this. I'm going to stick with my economics. Yeah, but, but that's but that's so brilliant because our generation grew up on the joke that Reagan made when he said, you know, what's what's the most six terrifying words that you can ever hear I'm in your from lifetime? I'm the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> my, my brother, who was a, who was part of TARS back in the day, um, Teenage Republicans, had a hat that said that. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's 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 the Alex P. Keaton influence in a lot of ways on our generation where we had a very natural distrust for government, which also came from our parents as boomers fighting in the 60s for actually some pretty good stuff in a lot of ways, like ending the Vietnam War and uh, equal equal work for equal, equal pay for women and um, integration. I think those were all really good fights to pick. Um, and those are the things that rubbed up on us and it, and, it, and it largely defines us in a lot of ways. So I, when I see the culture going the opposite direction, I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't right. <laughs> you know, because we were on another path, which made a whole lot more sense. But um, you know, the only problem as a Gen Xer is you know what's our catchphrase? Whatever, um, you know what where we fell down is because we are independent. We like to be left alone because we were <laughs> our entire lives. Yep. Um, that we didn't fight enough to preserve help preserve freedom, and so that's where we've fallen down and how we've gotten into the situation with this government behemoth that is spending too much, putting out too many laws has expanded its purview or is doing all these things. And so it is incumbent upon all of us now to um, do whatever we can to try and fight this Frankenstein that we've built. But yep. you know, Frankenstein's pretty, pretty, pretty big and pretty powerful at this point. Yeah, Ted Nugent calls it Fedzilla, which is what I like to call it. And we're, we're very much like the silent generation. We just want to be left alone. And we figured if, if Washington doesn't bother us, then what difference does it make? And that's a really dangerous yeah. attitude to take. And I'm thinking to myself, like Andrew Breitbart said, politics is downstream from culture. So if you poison the culture, it's going to travel downstream into entertainment, tech, journalism, yeah. education, entertainment. And we fell asleep at the switch 30 years ago when we basically gave up culture. Uh, the idea that movies and TVs and entertainment doesn't matter. Those are just silly kids stuff. Well, they matter just as much as education, and we're seeing that now. So um, getting back to the 80s, our favorite decade, a hopeful decade, uh, you know, very different than the 90s. The 90s were a cynical decade. Uh, Gen Xers are largely cynical, but, um, you know, that's just because we're a product of our environments growing up. Um, but, you know, I remember when everybody was talking about Japan was going to eat our lunch back then, and everyone was predicting that Japan would overtake us and suck out all of our manufacturing. Ron Howard even made a movie about it called Gung Ho. Good movie. Everyone should see it. It seems like it wasn't so much Japan, but it's China who's been eating our lunch and stealing our manufacturing, our patents, our intellectual property and the like. You touch upon this um, in the book, the bad trade deals, the selling out of the middle class. I think it started largely with NAFTA under Clinton. Um, you know, but, but really, this is, this is a China problem at this point, and we are obviously and have been in an economic war with China, at least a, a trade war. Uh, what's the best path going forward to you know, uh, stave off China and pull more jobs back into America? Um, you know, where, where do we go from here, especially with Biden? Yeah, so China is super a super interesting case study, and it's why I spent a whole chapter talking about it and talking about how it's entirely our central planner's fault who entered into quote unquote free market capitalism with a communist part a partner or somebody who doesn't 
uh, value individual rights, human rights, and property rights. And so obviously they were not going to, it, it was not going to be a, a good and fair trade deal for us. And we've seen the outgrowth of that. Um, so, you know, I am um, a little bit more uh, probably optimistic in terms of what happens with China based on the fact that communism you can't endure because of its own challenges. So the, the, the things that they have put forth, their one child policy, um, not only has created an entire generation of males that don't have any prospects for marriage, which if you look back in history, isn't a real good thing, um, but they also have an aging population. And I, I, I think I cite some of the statistics in the book, um, but you know they are going to tilt um, to you know, so many people needing to be on assistance and not enough people working and within a very short period of time here. So they've got a huge internal uh, problem coming, which is I think why they're panicking a little and you're seeing them act up in, in other ways. Um, and you know, in terms of them becoming the, the world reserve currency, I mean, they're the biggest financial cheaters out there. And I, I say this not flippantly, but there's the data. And, and again, I talk about in the book, all of the different fraudulent companies that have been listed on the US stock exchanges that have had to be, you know, that have had to get pulled back off because of accounting fraud. Um, I don't think anybody's really excited about letting communists <laughs> sort of be in charge of the world's currency. So the people keep talking about them, like, yeah, like maybe Iran like jumps in on that, but like, you know, it's like anybody, any of the major countries really going to do that. I don't think so. Um, so I do think they have their own problems. Plus they're also not an emerging market anymore. It's, it's become quite expensive. Uh, their factory system has shifted. You know, their workers want more money, so a lot of that manufacturing, you know, between the human rights violation, the intellectual property theft, um, and all that is starting to move to Vietnam and Malaysia and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, listen, we should be cracking down on their human rights issues. I mean, I don't know why nobody cares about the Uyghur Muslims, but they're in concentration camps in China. Like, and everyone seems to be like, well, you know, uh, um, we, they're, they're, should... everyone here is constant, you know, is concentrating on the concentration camps that they call down the border. You know, they, the, the kids I mean, down the border in concentration if, camps, but if, nobody cares about the, the if weed. you don't like slavery, like you should look into China, um, you know, attacking people based on who they are and their faith and, and the horrible, you know, things that have been done there that have been reported widely. Um, and, you know, I think companies should be rethinking manufacturing. If I had been President Trump, President Trump was right in terms of he's the first president to really go after China. He did it. He executed it in the wrong way through this tariff situation, which, again, was and I lay this out in the book insane like you could have a candelabra with with three sconces that like wasn't didn't have a tariff but if you had two sconces you did have a it, it was insane and as we know u.s uh consumers end up paying for tariffs what they should have done is they should have gone after prop, uh, intellectual property and investment right if you are part of the, the chinese communist party and, and a Chinese resident, not you know, not an American. If you're an American, you do obviously we're not, we're not talking about Chinese Americans, but you know, Chinese uh, nationals. Like you cannot you know invest in U.S. property. You cannot you know make investments into U.S. companies. They are not going to us and, and our allies are not going to enforce any of your intellectual property. I mean, do the same thing to them that they are doing back to us, which by the way, if you're a US company, you can't invest in China without a Chinese partners, they steal your intellectual property, so on and so forth. So just basically run their playbook back to them. Um, that, you know, I think that would have been much more effective, but unfortunately, again, you know, cronyism um, tends to, to win out. It's the reason why we normalize trade relations you know, with this communist country, walk them into the World Trade Organization and why they had this explosive growth moving closer to capitalism, never getting there because again, they don't enforce property rights, but moving from full control in that direction and to their benefit. And then we did the opposite. We've moved away from capitalism towards central planning to our detriment. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I love the idea of just uh, running their own game back on them. I think that's brilliant. And I, I kind of thought that's what we were doing to a degree, but obviously, according to your book, it's not. No. Uh, there, there was a better path there. And maybe if we get Trump back in 2024 or we get the first Gen X president, the 42-year-old rock star, Ron DeSantis, who Jesse and I affectionately call Heavy D, um, maybe that's something that he can take a look at because um, – I, I just love the idea of being older than the president. I just think it's fantastic. And him being, and him being a Gen Xer. I mean, it's like the idea that he was sitting like in class with me, you know, and, you know, you, you know, like, like, like a year before I graduated. I mean, that's essentially who Ron is. I mean, he's. That, he's that's, the, that's the difference between men and, and women. <laughs> fair no enough. woman takes any pride in that. So. Fair enough. I hear you. Hey, let's uh, let's go back to the '70s real quick. Um, another Gen X topic. We actually lived through stagflation as kids. Um, I was a baby. You were a little bit older. You might remember maybe your parents talking about this stuff or dealing with it. But um, in the '70s, we had double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, and double-digit interest rates. Uh, people don't know this, uh, but Prime was 20% during Carter. Uh, and it all led to stagflation. Explain to our younger viewers, the millennials and the Gen Zers, what is stagflation? And with uh, inflation largely rocketing to the moon in the last five or six months, is stagflation something that we might see rear its ugly head again? Yeah, no, I'll be brief because I know we're running short on time here. Um, basically, stagflation is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's where the economy is stagnating. It is not growing, but you're seeing, still seeing inflation in terms of wages and other prices. So it's sort of the worst of all worlds because you're not getting inflation based on you know, other growth going along with it. Um, and you're not getting deflation where everything's moving in the opposite direction. You're just st you're stalled out, but you're getting that big inflation, which I think is this very weird historic set of monetary policy um, with some of the fiscal breaks that we're seeing out of the Biden administration that will potentially tamp down on growth, I think is a very p realistic p potential outcome. Uh, but as I've been talking about pretty extensively, um, you know, for the last year and, and definitely in the last few months, there are like 12 different potential outcomes. None of them are real great. Some of them are like borderline apocalyptic. And that goes back to the level of the Federal Reserve intervention in the market. It goes back to the runaway government spending, which is you know heading um, quickly towards $30 trillion in accumulated national debt from all of these individual deficits that we add up to create the national debt because we don't fund our deficits in any other way. They don't have anything to fund it with. Um, and we're not apparently selling off land or landmarks or whatever other ways we could you know, potentially raise capital um so yeah it's uh, a lot of a lot of crazy things i mean we got we got a rain in government spending we've got a rain in the fed um we've got to you know get barriers to wealth creation out of the way we've got to move back along that spectrum to free markets otherwise we're going to end up you know in a socialist situation best case scenario looks like the uk or france worst case scenario looks like venezuela <sighs> Yeah, I don't like any of those. Yeah, frankly. no, I mean, like, the, the choices aren't great. So, like, no. people really, that, I mean, that's part of why I wrote the book. I want to educate and inform people so that you can go out and tell other people. Like, I can't tell everybody this. <laughs> so, you you get the book, you read it, you tell other people. We start spreading the message, and then once people really understand this stuff, is when we can come together and, and try to to put the brakes on it. Well, what I like about your book is it it does not preach to the converted. I think I think it's um, um, I think a lot of people can access it and be open to it. It's not partisan or hyper partisan or any way. It's uh, it's very much down down the center. And I think I think if the culture can kind of come back to the center, we can all start having discussions again and actually talking about this stuff rather than just yelling at each other from you know these these the far left and the far right. Uh, it's just to me it's boring and it's not productive. Yes. Um, and it just keeps us distracted from the real problems. So anyway, um, I'm going to cut it short because we went long. Uh, you just <laughs> so much fun to talk to. I, I had, I had my roadmap of questions, but we, we deviated just because I love it. That's, that's, that's how my mind works. Do that, right? <laughs> so, um, 
uh, since we're out of time, uh, I want to thank you for joining us and give everybody your social media coordinates so everyone watching can find you online. Yes. Yeah, so the first, I'll just be my capitalist plug. The War on Small Business, yes. wherever fine books are sold, consider buying from a small business bookseller if you want to vote with your dollars. And uh, I spend most of my time on Twitter. If you try me somewhere else, I probably won't notice. So uh, at Carol J.S. Roth, it's in my little cryon underneath there, at Carol J.S. Roth on Twitter. Uh, if you have a warped sense of humor and like to learn things from time to time, that's where you'll find me. Well, and also, Carol, where can they get your book? Because uh, I know that you can buy your book through a small business uh, if, if people want to. If they don't want to go to Amazon, if they want right. to buy it from maybe a, a local small bookstore, wh where can they go online to do that? Yeah, so there's a, um, a place called bookshop.org online that basically fulfills through local small businesses if you want a one-stop. Um, they, I believe, are back-ordered because we've set so much traffic to them, um, which has been awesome. So you might have to wait a little bit to get it fulfilled. But if you want it now, if you look up the War on Small Business, Harper Collins, who's the publisher, they have a list of retailers. And the first list are like the bit, most of the bigger names, although Bookshop is on there. But there's another link underneath that that says show more, and it'll show some of the independents that are also carrying the book. Um, so I suggest if you want to, to check or if you have a favorite local bookstore, even if they don't have it, you can ask them to order it because it's through publishers HarperCollins. So um, they have easy access. So support awesome. your small businesses if you are so inclined. Yes, please do frequent those small businesses. Um, Amazon's great, and they, you know, you get stuff within two to three days. They've changed the psychology of shipping and fulfillment completely, but at the expense of the small business. So uh, it's worth waiting a couple extra days to support the small business, I believe. So I think that's what people should do. But either way, everybody should get your book because it's fantastic, and um, we just really appreciate having you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to have you back. And um, I know our viewers would as well. So um, thanks again. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And uh, as a reminder, Gen X is the best generation. Gen X is going to have to save the world, Carol. Uh, <laughs> I'm convinced. Nobody else Nobody else can do it. You know, the, the analog babies have got to come in and rescue all of these, uh, these, these, digital, these digital kids. All so, right. Let's do it. Thanks. Great to see thanks you. Thanks so much. Everyone, make sure and check out thepoliticalinsider.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Also, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please like and share this video far and wide. Subscribe to The Political Insider on Rumble and YouTube so you never miss out on any of our new videos like this one. Till next time, everyone keep the faith and stay frosty. Thanks again, Carol.